Hello everyone. I'm so excited to be here talking to you today virtually. The talk today is going to be about using innovation and storytelling to support your brain health. My name is Jillian Hill and I am a clinician at the Center for Brain Health's Brain Performance Institute. So before we get into the talk, I just want to tell you a little bit about who we are. I know you, some of you are probably familiar with us and you've probably also heard a couple of my colleagues speak, but I just wanted to give a little background um, just in case. Okay, so the Center for Brain Health is a research institute. We study cognitive health and performance. And the Brain Performance Institute specifically is the, the kind of community arm of this research institute. We are able to, to reach out and do um, trainings and speaking engagements and, and things like this to be able to spread our mission, which is to unlock human potential through improved brain health and performance. So I'm really excited to be able to share some of this information with you today um, that'll do just that. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, how to keep our brains sharp and maintain that cognitive vitality um, through a process we call innovation and you're gonna learn a little bit more about that and how to practice it in everyday life. Okay, so have you ever wondered, how do I keep my brain sharp as I age? I'm sure most people have wondered this uh, from time to time. So there's no one key, right? So we're gonna talk about you know, how do we keep our brain sharp? There's not just one way, right? It's a combination of a number of different factors and components, everything from your physical health and nutrition, your physical fitness, to your psychological well-being, to your social connections, and then also your cognitive engagement. And that's just really, that really means how do you choose to challenge and engage your brain every single day? And that's really one of the keys to cognitive vitality, to keeping our brain sharp and working for us is to really um, be intentional and proactive about how we choose to engage and challenge our brain on a daily basis. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but first, I wanted to tell you about a concept called neuroplasticity. You've probably heard of it if you've listened to any of our other talks before. We love to talk about it, um, mainly because it's exactly why we do what we do. This is the whole reason that we bring programs like this to the community. Uh, neuroplasticity is a capacity and function that every single one of our brains has throughout our entire lifespan. And really, it just means that our brain has the ability to grow, adapt, and change just based on how we choose to use it every single day. So every single day is an opportunity for your brain to push forward or to move backwards. In brain health, we always say there is no staying in the same place. If you're just complacent and not doing anything to push yourself forward, then you're going to actually allow your brain health to move backwards. So neuroplasticity allows us to take advantage of the ability to grow and change our brain simply through the way that we choose to engage it every single day. So that's really exciting. And it's something that I hope everybody's excited about learning new ways uh, to do that and to really capitalize on this great capacity that we all have throughout our entire lifespan. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about one of the ways that we can maintain our cognitive engagement and a way that we can kind of spark that brain energy. And it's through a capacity called innovation. So I want you before I display anything on this slide to just think to yourself, what do you think innovation means or what does it mean to you? Okay, hopefully everybody has some thoughts forming on that. So we define innovation in a slightly different way. So first, let's talk about what we mean um, at a brain level when we talk about innovation. Innovation is a frontally mediated brain function. All that means is that the frontal lobes or frontal networks of our brain are responsible for innovation. And the frontal networks of our brain are, are very important. They are the area of the brain that really is the hub of all complex thinking and information processing. It's the area of the brain that we often call the CEO of the brain because it's really that important to the function um, and health of our brain. It's the area of the brain where a lot of information comes together, is integrated, is processed so that we can do things like planning, reasoning, problem solving. Even our emotional regulation has um, some frontally mediated components to it. And so these high level functions are what help uh, to keep us 
moving forward and functioning well in our everyday life. That's what the frontal networks of the brain do. So innovation is just one of the functions that the frontal network uh, can engage in. And innovation, you know, probably thought of invention, right? They sound alike. And a lot of times people equate the two things, innovation and invention. But it doesn't have to be that large, right? Innovation doesn't have to be about inventing something new, creating a new product, or having a big idea. Uh, really, when we think about innovation, we think about this continuous pursuit of betterment and change and mental flexibility. So mental flexibility is a huge part of innovative thinking. Uh, so just small changes, really, that's all it takes. Small changes to spark change, interest, or motivation. So little things that you can identify in your everyday life that can spark these things within you. That's innovation. And it can be something as simple as doing something that's slightly new or different, doing something that you usually do in a slightly different way, or even just having a different type of conversation or asking a different question within a conversation. So innovation doesn't have to be huge. It's something that the brain thrives on though, even if it's a small change, the brain loves novelty. And just think about, you know, a time when you were engaged in something that was really exciting to you, maybe a new job, maybe a new stage in your life where you were figuring something out that you've never been involved in before, maybe a new hobby that you've taken up that you were very interested in or a new topic that you started learning about. Think about how you felt. You likely felt excited, motivated, you wanted to do more, you wanted to learn more, see more, read more. And that's because your brain loves challenge and novelty. So when you're engaged and interested in something, bringing that level of challenge up a little bit really keeps the brain continuing to be engaged and continuing to be active. And that's really one of the keys to keeping your cognitive vitality going strong. So we're gonna talk about some ways you can do that in everyday life. So like I said, innovation doesn't have to be a huge thing. It can be something that you do in everyday life um, in small ways. So conversations, just think about how to ask a new question or talk about a new topic, right? So we all have those conversations that tend to get a little bit repetitive, they get a little bit boring maybe even. Um, we might ask the same thing, kind of talk about the same things all the time, and that's fine. There's a level of comfort to that that's really enjoyable as part of our social connection with others. But if we start to think about, you know, what if today we, you know, asked a new question or started talking about something slightly different that we've never talked about before? This person that I, you know, go to lunch with or, or share a conversation with um, pretty frequently, what could we do that's slightly different or new? What could we talk about that maybe we've never covered before? Try a new activity. That can be one way to spark innovation. Really just trying something new, even if it's something small. Uh, a new game, you know, maybe you have a, a club that you play a game with or a, a book club, you know, so trying something slightly new within an activity that you already enjoy, that can certainly be innovative. Um, just thinking about something that you have always wondered about and would like to try. Think about taking the first step towards doing that, you know, that's innovation as well. Practicing gratitude and awe, those are ways that you can practice uh, innovation in everyday life. So there's a lot of research, up and coming research in neuroscience that talks about how gratitude and awe actually can change our brain structure and function. It can actually work within our brain to wire our brain for more positive thinking, for more resilience, for less you know, anxiety and worry and depression and things like that. So being able to do that requires you to be proactive and intentional. So it's a practice, right? It says practice gratitude, not just say, oh, I'm grateful, you know, in general for my life, but specific things. So there are gratitude journals. You can create your own. You can even just sit and think every day about two specific things that I was grateful for today. Even if it was kind of a quiet, you know, boring day, surely there's something in that day that you found awe, you noticed that was awe-inspiring or that you felt grateful for. And simply putting words to those, writing it down and keeping that list going and really engaging in that uh, intentional practice is a wonderful way to exercise your brain uh, innovation networks. So that would be something that you know anyone could do. It doesn't require very much preparation at all um, to start doing that every single day. And even, you know, even going further than that, to express that to someone else, you know, so being able to express your gratitude maybe in a slightly different way than usual 
you know, thank you notes are a great thing, but maybe you can do, you know, write a slightly different thank you note than you used to, right? Or, or some, think of a new way to express gratitude to somebody in a way that would be meaningful and purposeful. Um, and then another one that we're going to talk about a little bit more deeply for the rest of this talk is to engage in storytelling. And everybody might be thinking like, what are you talking about engage in storytelling? So we're going to talk about that. But storytelling itself is a brain exercise. It's like going to the brain gym, essentially. It is a wonderful exercise of so many functions in our brain that are key to being able to maintain cognitive vitality and also spark those innovation networks. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so how in the world is storytelling a brain exercise? Well, for one, it involves complex thinking processes. So a lot of those complex processes, like we mentioned earlier, are part of that frontal network, frontal lobes of your brain. And those areas are key to maintaining their fitness in order to keep that cognitive vitality and mental sharpness going. So storytelling requires organization and planning. So you have to think through some chronology, you have to think through the events, it taps into that long-term memory. Um, and it also utilizes language skills. So oftentimes, you know, we, if you think back to a story that you haven't really talked about or thought about in a long time, just finding the way to express that story to convey the emotions behind it or, you know, really tell the story of what happened, that utilizes and taps into some complex language skills, some complex organization and planning skills within our frontal networks that are really important to maintain an exercise. And also storytelling enhances our social connection. So, you know, we think about brain health again as a holistic endeavor. There are many factors and social connection is a big one. And so being able to share a part of yourself, a part of your life through storytelling with someone else is a really great way to enhance the social connections that you already have. So we're gonna talk about some specific ways um, to engage in storytelling to make it a brain exercise. Okay, so the good thing is if anybody's feeling like, oh, brain exercise, that makes me feel nervous. I'm not sure if I will do it right. The great thing about this is there's no wrong way to tell a story. So just remember that, keep reminding yourself of that. There's no wrong way to tell a story. So how could you get started? Um, there can be, you know, what we're, I'm gonna refer to as more of an informal practice and more of a formal practice, okay? So on the left side of the screen here, we have some examples of some more informal type of practice. So you can inject storytelling into your everyday life. So this is where you think about the conversations that you have. You know, maybe you have a Bible study that you attend, a, uh, a lunch group, or just kind of get together to go on a walk with, with people every now and then, or um, any number of different gatherings, you know, whether they might be virtual right now, but still those opportunities where you're connecting with people. Think about all the different opportunities that you do have and engage in, and think about where in those types of interactions, even if they're just personal relationships with your family, your loved ones and friends, where are you in a rut, maybe a conversation rut? Are there people that you talk to where you kind of cover the same topics over and over again, and then you feel like maybe there's nothing new, that you've brought to that in a while. Be innovative there. That's a great place to start and say, hey, this relationship is meaningful to me and I get purpose and meaning from it. So I wanna see if I can inject a little bit more change and innovation into that. So think about those conversational ruts that you get into and think about how to change them just a little bit. Ask a new question, right? So maybe if you're uh, getting together with somebody or, or meeting with someone virtually, think taking a little bit of time to just say, hey, today, I was just thinking the other day about, you know, the first job that I ever had. What was yours? I'd love to tell you about mine, you know? So thinking about these things where, you know, you may have a long standing relationship with someone and you've never covered any of these topics. That's a great time to be innovative and say, let's, you know, let's make this into not only uh, an enjoyable conversation to share and you might learn something new, but it's an innovative brain exercise as well. That's very important um, and healthy for your brain. You can even start an official, more official group around it, right? So sometimes they're called reminiscence groups. Um, you can even just make it a component of a group that you're already in. You know, go around and, and share um, a story that is related to a topic that you're discussing in that group or pick a new topic and have everyone share a story related to that. 
Um, and, you know, make sure that you, you know, think about your, your loved ones and friends that you talk to all the time. What's something about you that maybe they never knew? What's something that you've never maybe brought up to them before? You'd be surprised. Sometimes you may think like, oh, everybody, you know, they know everything about me. I've known them for years. Or they're my family. They know everything about me. But, you know, there may be maybe stories or events from your life from before they were involved in your life that they have never heard before. And those can be really ripe areas to, to dig into that conversation and to share um, that storytelling with them. So how could you do this more formally if you want to kind of make it an exercise where you actually build something tangible out of it? This is a great thing to do. Um, I used to work with some groups when we were working in, in person at the Center for Brain Health. Right now we're all virtual, but um, we used to get together with some groups and, and create collections of life stories. And so essentially this is a brain exercise activity that you can do yourself on your own with friends, with loved ones, with family members. And, uh, and so here are some ways that you can get started with that. First, you just want to brainstorm some topics across your lifespan, right? So think about things that were particular standouts to you, right? So big events in your life. Some of them are those common events that we, you know, always think of the birth of a child, you know, going uh, to college or a first job, those sorts of things. But really think back and think, what are those unique experiences that I had um, that really kind of keep coming back to me when I, when I think about certain periods of my life? And so it might be like, you know, saving up your money for your first car or that first, you know, uh, vacation abroad that you got to take. So those types of things that really bring back those vivid memories for you, maybe you don't think about them very often, maybe you haven't talked about them in years, but brainstorming those kind of topics are really, is really a good way to build out a really robust collection of life stories. And you can, you know, even recruit people to help you do this brainstorming you know, get a loved one or a friend and, and say, you know, what about me would you like to know? You know, what topics would you like to know about me? Um, and start kind of keeping that list. And then, you know, think about how you want to, to really structure your collection of life stories. Do you want it to be a book? Um, do you want it to be videos where you actually share those stories um, in a recorded fashion? Do you want it to be written where you write those stories yourself and kind of keep them um, you know, in a binder or somehow get them, you know, bound together or printed. Uh, you can even find pictures that accompany them. That can be some, you know, a good way to get started. That's how we got started often with our groups that I would do at the Center for Brain Health is to find a picture that really was attached to a memory or story in your life and then tell that story that would explain the picture to someone who had never seen it before. And so, you know, thinking through those things, you can, you know, you can just print out pages and put them in a binder. You can keep it in an all digital format. You can just, you know, type it in if that's uh, something that you're comfortable with and that you enjoy. You can handwrite it if that's something that's important to you that you really enjoy. Um, and then, you know, the pictures are optional, but they're always a great addition, especially when you're sharing those books uh, or, or life story collections with family members and friends. And then, you know, just choose how you want to write it down or have it recorded and kind of develop a method for that. So I'm going to show you an example um, on the next slide. And this one is actually an example from my own grandfather's collection of life stories that I helped um, to write for him. And so you'll see that there's a picture and a very shortened version. So essentially, you know, typically it would be like about a page or more of a story. I've just kind of given a, a brief excerpt of this right here that you can see. And so you see there's a picture of um, the ship that he was on um, when he was in the Battle of the Coral Sea, and then a, a brief account in his own words. That's the, that's really, you know, where the richness of this comes is uh, being able to explain in his own words, you know, what happened and how he experienced that particular thing. It's not something you can read in, about in a history book, right? Um, you can read the, the basic details, but this is a, a real person's account of that. So it doesn't have to be something as large as a naval battle. It can be something like my first day of school. It can be something like my first job. Um, a vacation I really enjoyed, or the time that I, you know, went on a camping trip with my son's Boy Scout troop. Anything where you really, you know, have a, a story that you can tell that's tied to a memory, maybe tied to a picture, that can be an excellent way to start that.
Um, and, and, you know, remember when you're doing that, when you're engaging in that, whether it's just verbally or whether you're really creating a, a life story collection that is going to be a tangible physical item, remember that every single bit of that is a brain exercise that's engaging key frontal networks in your brain and it's engaging neuroplasticity. It's really helping you to harness the power of neuroplasticity and helping you positively change your brain simply by the way that you engage it. And in this case, engaging it in something that's enjoyable and fun to do. You know, a lot of times we don't think of um, things that are good for, you know, always good for us as being the most fun, right? It's like, oh, okay, I know I have to get my physical exercise, but sometimes that might not always be the most fun. But this is truly something that you can enjoy doing and that you can uh, really get a good brain benefit from. And you have to be proactive and innovative. And if you do that, you, you will be getting that benefit and seeking to challenge and engage your brain to maintain that cognitive vitality. So I'd really encourage you to get started with thinking about ways that you can be innovative in everyday life, whether it's just having a slightly different type of conversation, trying a new type of activity, really reaching out and kind of stretching that mental flexibility and saying, where am I stuck in a rut? What could I do that's slightly different to push or challenge myself in a way that's enjoyable and engaging um, and thinking about how to make storytelling a part of that if that's something that would be interesting to you. So if you have any questions, you can certainly email me. I really appreciate your time today and I hope that you all have a wonderful new year.